that's great. Uh, so I just say that you're self -help. Let me just make sure my boss is happy. Okay. Oh, you want to say something? Oh, wait, we're going to start uh, a video session now. We're about to have a series of three very interesting video sessions. Uh, the aim of these sessions is to be as interactive as possible. You will not get this anywhere else because you're going to get uh, step by step instructions on how to do very basic surgery that can be as quick as you do in your restaurant or even in your train room. And then it is with great pleasure okay, to introduce Simon Tong, who is an idea technique fellow in Toronto and previous time previously trained at Portis. And I'm sure you all know Sir Tom Ferris as well, who was helping you yesterday and on Saturday with uh, with his bilateral. Okay, and th th they're going to be talking to us about penetration injuries. Okay, right. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So uh, we'll kickstart with the uh, the session. Uh, I have no financial interest, but as you know, Dr. Uh, Ferris is uh, the founder, pretty much the uh, simulator ocular surgeon, which we'll use some material as well. Um, now, it's difficult to show you all the videos that we do, or especially in my case, because uh, uh, thinking about the level that we're talking about, I do pediatric corneal grafts and pediatric corneal injuries it would not be fair to talk about those things. So let's go back to the basics, the principles, and we'll use both slides, pictures, and videos to kind of illustrate some of the points that I think will be useful to take home, okay? And if there's any questions in between, just put your hand up, we can always answer it, uh, not a problem. So let's just talk about the principle of open globe management, and really we're looking at assessment, and then the surgical principles of how to basically manage them, okay? Um, I think because of where I come from in terms of my surgical field, I'll probably mostly concentrate on the anterior segment side. And in the posterior segment surgery or uh, injuries, uh, generally speaking, it may be a little bit difficult for, uh, 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 for a generalist to kind of cover. So we'll concentrate on those things, which is simple things, do it basic, and doesn't mean it's easy to do, okay? So looking at assessment or open globe, there are a few things that uh, immediately you should do when you have a case coming in. Things to look out for are obvious wounds. I mean, if you look at this, it's obvious there's an incision, then you know, well, this is going to be an open globe injury. Well, about this one, for example, it, it although it's not leaking, well, iris is plugging a hole, is an open globe injury. There are times when things are not so obvious, okay? So, for example, you may have a high femur with or without a corneal wound. When you see a high femur, just think a little bit. Is it an open globe in the anterior segment, or is it could it be something else that's hi uh, hiding maybe in the posterior segment? Sometimes aqueous leak is not very easy to spot, okay? Pseudo test is very useful in this case. So uh, I usually say to people that uh, the usual, uh, uh, like a diluted fluorescein drops is not really going to do the trick. So you need the high concentration of 2%, either in a strip or in the individual drops. And sometimes you actually need to try several times to identify where the site of the leak is. And it's important to mention about the concentration just because I've seen leaks being missed with the diluted ones. And don't forget about well, this one. For example, you can see the the the, uh, uh, the bleeding is pretty much all subcontentival around the eye. And actually, what you don't see on the side as well is that there's some element of anophthalmos, so the eye is sunken. So again, you've got to think about, is there some sort of injury? I, uh, the open globe may not be in the cornea, but it could be behind the uh, conjunctival space. And sometimes it should be so subtle that it's just a lid that is showing. Now, it's important that you think about, well, it's so difficult to see in here I really want to have a good look, okay? There are things you should not do, okay? Do not feel the eye. Just don't press it. You know what's gonna happen, right? So just don't do it. <laughs> there are a few things, other things you shouldn't do as well. I think Goldman telometer really, maybe not the best thing to do, okay? You're gonna open your eyes, you're gonna put it in, it's not a great thing. If you've got an eye care or, or those like a really, really light contact, maybe it's negotiable, but tonal pen, I wouldn't advise it either, okay? Um, people always talk about, well, should I do an ultrasound or not? We want to know the extent of the injury. I think if the patient is, you know, relaxed, not nervous, and you can actually gently do it over the lid, maybe. 
But I think if you have any doubt, I would just avoid it, okay? In these situations, a lot of times it's difficult. And it doesn't mean that you can't examine them later when they are already under anesthesia, okay? So you don't have to you know, make the situation even worse by doing something that is not necessarily needed to be done at that point. And the final point is don't force open the lids. Just because you can't have a good look, okay, doesn't mean you should just give it prize it open because that will exert enough pressure to make the wound gape open and have more content coming out. You should, however, check the RAPD if possible. And it is important to know the prognosis of these eyes. Um, you don't have to fully open the, uh, the eye that has trauma to check this RAPD because you can actually just look at a reaction on the other eye, okay? So you can do that. Now, immediately when you see these cases, let's say you are in the eye emergency, what can you do to, uh, if you're not, let's say, uh, either proficient in fixing them or you're not responsible for fixing them? So immediately, I think the, uh, the steps are you put a shield on top so that you don't have any more physical trauma to the eye. Uh, you give them analgesia and, and antiemetics. Now, it's important to control the pain and also control any, uh, uh, any sort of desire to, for them to have being nauseous or even vomiting. These could, again, increase the intraocular pressures and also, again, gaping the wound and uh, uh, encouraging the ocular content to express. Uh, depending on how you, uh, what kind of lumen clenture you can use, you can either go lube by mouth or new per oral, basically don't eat and drink, because they will be most likely needed to go under general anesthesia. You don't want to delay that by giving them something to eat and drink. It doesn't really matter what time it is, they can wait for that, okay? And talk to the anesthetist. Sometimes these patients could be very sick, okay? You are just one of the big part, big part of the medical team. Uh, a lot of times penetrating eye injury does not occur individually. They maybe have other uh, uh, medical trauma. So talk to the anesthetist, are they safe to go under? When can we fix it? Uh, and, and they may have other more life-threatening injuries to be sorted out first. Now, as I said, uh, the, uh, in terms of principles, there are sort of two distinct uh, uh, entities in, uh, in the anterior segment or in the posterior segment. I think posterior segment mostly done, uh, especially in UK, uh, is mostly done by the uh, vitreal retinal team. And uh, really, you know, within the time that we have, I think it, we, it would be impossible to go through everything, especially how to do a fitting. I'm not really a fit VR surgeon. So we'll concentrate on the anterior segment side of things. Now, if we look at anterior segment trauma, there are really, again, two other t uh, two types of trauma. There's one, one that is the blunt force trauma. And some of the examples here, again, you can see that the globe is intact, but then there are hyphemas, areodialysis, or sometimes in the extreme cases where the lens is actually dislocated into the anterior chamber. And I've been called four, uh, four in the morning for that. Uh, and that's the only time when the emergency uh, physician who said to me that I can see the lens clearly. And, and I couldn't believe it initially until I drove in and said, yes, it is actually very clear. Um, now, in these cases, you don't really need to do anything immediately. You don't have to panic and say, I need to fix this eye, okay? When the eye is contained, actually it's not necessarily, uh, it's not unreasonable to actually control the inflammation and control the pain, control all those things before planning a slightly more uh, 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 planned out surgery, okay? I mean, obviously in the lens and in the AC, yes, you, you have to do something soon, but it doesn't necessarily mean that moment, okay? So you've got some time to think and do the right thing. Compared to a penetrating eye injury like this, then yes, you should need to do something because that eye is going to be lost, okay? So what should you do? I mean, that's the, the key question, right? So let's say you are the surgeon and you're presented this case. There are the patients now anesthetized under general anesthetic. What should, you, what should be the first thought? A anyone had experience of fixing a, a, a penetrating eye injury? Someone to, someone to share the experience? What's in, what's out, basically. Say again, sorry? Uh, when you are in the general anesthesia, then you can easily examine everything, how big the laceration is, uh, what's in the eye, what's out, mm -hmm. uh, what's missing, basically. Uh, then try to uh, cover everything and think how to repair it, basically. Absolutely right. And I like, this, I like the, th uh, the fact that you say the first thing is how big the injury is. And I think that's a really important point. I think one of the biggest points to take away is that you've got to explore what we call the limbus. Sometimes the cut is not necessarily right in the middle. It could be involving limbus. And when you, the, in, uh, the injury is involving limbus, you've got to ask, is this just cornea or is it corneal scleral? 
okay, or is the posterior segment involved? It could be going all the way to the macula without exploring the limbus. So it's important. Now, in, thi in this video here, uh, sorry, in the last video, rather, in this video, I hope it's a video. It should be. Yeah, there you go. Uh, in this video here, you can see that the, uh, the corneal limbal junction is just involved, and the first thing we do actually is a peritomy. Okay, open that conge up. Uh, you got to fix it anyway, so it doesn't matter to create that little bit of incision to fully ex uh, examine what's the extent of the injury. And that actually has a very important factor in later on when you want to fix the eye, okay? So filing limbus is very important. In this case, luckily, we don't have any posterior ex uh, uh, extension, okay? But uh, I've also, again, done the eyes where it all the way goes to the macula. And without knowing that, just fixing the front of the eye is not going to make the globe intact, okay? So fully ex explore the, the wound and find out it's very important. The second thing, really, is just to stabilize the situation, right? Things are not right. You've got to make sure that you have the optimum uh, uh, operating field for you to fix whatever there is uh, to fix. So fiscal elastic really is your friend. And um, I think initially, when you have a big laceration, you can put the fiscal elastic through the wound to just inflate and re reform the anterior chamber. Once you have that, usually I think the useful thing to do would be to make a paracentesis so that you can control the anterior chamber from there onwards, okay? And uh, you can also use the fiscal cannula. I seem to have the video running all the time. You can also use the fiscal elastic cannula to reposition some of the lens or iris material so that they are not involving in the wound area before you close. If you close the wound with the iris in, in the middle, you're incarcerated, and I've seen cases where basically the iris will uh, form a bridge for blood vessels to grow all the way from the interior chamber into the corneal wound, everything stuck together, it will never come off, okay? And you basically, when I come to fix that particular case, I actually had to reopen the wound to free the tissue before I can actually close it again. So you've got to make sure that it's not trapped, okay? Now, some people talk about what about fitures because, you know, fitures is something that you can't really see. Um, because the eye is open, it's sometimes very difficult to do a vitrectomy right now. Okay, you can do open globe, uh, uh, open sky vitrectomy, uh, and, and you can use triamcinolone to help. But actually, at the beginning, you may just want to use scissors to cut some of the obvious things that you can see, and you can use a, wi uh, a wax cell or a, a, a micro sponge to touch it, and then you see that oh, what's sticky, and then you just cut it very gently without pulling too hard. Okay. Uh, and again, just to show you that you can do a vitrectomy, but uh, uh, maybe when the eye is more stable and then the, it will be more contained. Now, in terms of closing a wound, we had, uh, well how many people actually went to the wet lab last few days? Can you just raise your hands? Okay, so we've got enough. So, uh, you know, roughly speaking, what we're going to do, right? You had the practice. So the, the, the three main thing really is, uh, when we talked about aligning limbus, you suture the cornea. And then in the small ones, we'll talk about gluing right at the end. Uh, so let's say, talk about the limbus first, because we mentioned it already. So we'll see an example here where the, the injury extends all the way to the back. The first stitch should be at the limbus, okay? Not the cornea, not to the back, the limbus. The reason that is, is that when you put the stitch at the limbus, just like that, it aligns all the tissue together and makes the wound actually easier to close afterwards. You're not only making the wound smaller, but you're also basically approximating the wound edges so that the lights are going to close, uh, are going to, 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 to the lights. The corneal tissue are going to corneal tissue. The scleral tissue is going to scleral tissue, okay? If you have a jagged, like a non-aligned uh, uh, injury, uh, a non-aligned uh, uh, closure, what would happen is that you'll find out that the eye will keep on ke leaking all the time. You can stitch the cornea as tight as you want, it will still want to leak at the limbus. And I, again, I have a case of that. Just uh, uh, it was sent in from uh, our province, our, our state, from where I'm working. And again, I have to restitch to Hawaii. So it's very important the first stitch is there. The difference in terms of suture material is that usually at limbus, people like to, to put in the 9 0 line on sutures rather than 10 For the cornea, we like to use the 10 0 line on because it's finer, it's easy to use to turn and all those things we can talk about later. But for the limbus and the scleral wound, because the tissue is harder, the needle of the 10 actually gets blunt very easily. So you want to you have the 9 and also it will give you more tension uh, or ten tensile strength to hold the wound together, okay? And once you've aligned it, you can then, as you see, you can uh, uh, close the wound easily afterwards because everything would be approximating. 
And we talked about a little bit on the wet lab. I see that quite a few people went to the wet lab. So you should know that when you put the suture, let's say take in the corner, for example, uh, you want to have the equal width on both sides. You put it maybe one to two millimeters, depending on how wide the wound is. You put it 90% uh, depth of the cornea. And this is the perfect way. So you can see that these are some of the not so perfect way. Okay, the top one you can see is too deep. In fact, it's so deep that it actually went through the cornea. And the second one is too shallow. So you still just got this posterior gaping. And uh, what will happen is actually that not only it won't close very well, it will keep on having corneal edema for quite some time. Okay, so you want to be a little bit deeper than that. And if you don't have it completely in the right place, you see that actually the two edges of the tissue will just override. So it's important to have the same depth as well. So my tip in here, in terms of doing the cornea uh, uh, suturing, is that you use your left hand and use a pickup, something with teeth, like two forceps or, or 0 0.12, whatever it is. You pick up the edge, and then when you put the needle, you just visualize the needle where it comes out. And then when you go through the other side, you can either just push or you also evert the other edge. You see exactly where you put the needle through. Uh, so if you have physical elastic, it's easier to do that, okay? Obviously, it's difficult. I mean, I'm a corneal surgeon, so I am get used to do this. Uh, the, the, the more traditional way, actually, is don't touch any of the wound edges at all and just do a smooth round pass, okay? And that's probably uh, uh, at the primary uh, stage, maybe that's sufficient, okay? I'm very particular about suture, you can see, okay. <laughs> so that's the, uh, that's the how deep that you shouldn't go. And again, actually, I forgot to mention that when it's too deep, you can actually get leaks from the suture tracks. That's why you don't want to go all the way full thickness, okay. So this is just, again, showing you how, you know, a corner uh, suture could be placed, okay. And you can see in here, he didn't really put, uh, grab the edge. He did, however, use the left hand to help to get the uh, suture out. So I'll just show you again. You go through, and then on a second pass, using the left hand to indent the corneal tissue so that the needle can come out easier. Okay, so there's another way to do it. Now, one of the uh, concepts of suturing, and this video I'm going to show you next is not a cornea. One of the concepts that we want to use to uh, suture any wounds is what we call the ship to shore concept. So, in here, first of all, you see that in here. I'll just show you, show you the first time first. The needle goes through from the flap to the where it's most stable, okay? You can obviously suture the other way around, but the easiest thing is actually moving the mobile side to the really stable side, and that's what we call the ship to shore, because you don't move the port to help the ship, right? You have to move the ship to go to the shore. That's why it's called ship to shore. Uh, and, and that concept really helps a lot if you see which is the mobile end, which, which is the stable end, and that helps you to close the wound. So after putting the first pass, you know, what do you do? You, uh, again, the, for those of you who have been to the wet lab, you will know how to lock a suture, okay? So locking a suture means that you put it placed down first. Oh, sorry. Oops. And then the, you pull the stitch over, okay? I'll just show you again. Oh, so let's go back to there. So put it down first. And just notice on this side, okay? When you're putting over, you've got to lift it up with tension, okay? So without tension, that knot will be loose, okay? And you want to lock it so that you have time to do the second pass, okay? Now, it's a bit difficult to know exactly how you know, tight you should do, okay? If I, again, another tickle message is that if I can say, if you can go either too tight or too loose, I would say, err on the side of too tight, okay? The reason is because of this. So when you have the fresh injury, what happens is that you have exposed stroma to the acris and also the physical last that you put in as well. So you would have actually a lot of corneal edema in that wound already. If you put in the suture that is just right, when the uh, edema resolves, the sutures will all be too loose, okay? So you'd rather be too tight at the time of closure, just in case that when the cornea is not edematous anymore, the sutures will not be too loose. Okay, so just earn on side of too tight. And as surgeons, we do the reef knot. Uh, if you are accustomed of making a adjustable knot, you can also use that to really further tighten the corner as well. Uh, but again, we haven't really got time to discuss that today. So stick it with a reef knot, lock it before you make the second uh, uh, second uh, um, over tie, uh, and uh, earn on side of caution, make it tighter than before uh, than than you think you need. 
when you finish the knot, it's not done, okay? You've got to bury it, okay? I have seen so many cases, actually also in children, unfortunately, where the knots were all exposed. And obviously, the next day when you see them, you cannot see the eye, right? Because it's irritated. So make sure to turn the knot. And um, the, the easy way to turn it, actually, is to have the eye a little bit pressurized. A completely soft eye is not really going to be helping, which is why you make the paracetamol earlier so that you can inject uh, uh, um, the uh, BSS or balanced soap solution to pressurize the eye and also exchange the physical elastic before you turn the, the sutures, okay? And make sure you turn every one of them. So having one is not gonna be, it, it, it's gotta be helpful. Now, there are times when, uh, so this is just turning the sutures. There are times when the wound is not exactly perpendicular and they are a little bit more challenging. Uh, so you can see that on top, if, I, uh, if we put the sutures just exactly midline of the wound, then it will be too much on one side and too little on the other side. In that situation, you may have to actually adjust where you put in the suture, okay? If, again, if I share a, a, a sort of like a simple pearl for you is that if you are having these wounds to close and you're not sure, just go a little wider. Go and go too short because you may actually be so short up, up there that this, the suture itself will actually cheese wire and will not hold the wound, okay? So go a little bit wider, okay? So the top one is not the right one. Now we said that we'll talk about corneal gluing. So for the last 10 minutes or so, we just talk about how to do it because quite frankly, a lot of the uh, uh, penetrating eye injury that we see may not be as big as needing a suture. And it's important for a, a young ophthalmologist to know how to just do simple gluing. And the good thing is that with gluing, sometimes the cornea actually seals itself afterwards without needing further surgery. So it's useful to know. Uh, so uh, the sort of the common uh, indications of gluing instead of suturing are you have either impending perforations or the perforations are quite small. Three millimeters is kind of the cutoff, okay? Uh, you don't really have any iris plugging the hole uh, and it's away from the limbus. When it's at the limbus, it doesn't really stick very well in the glue, okay? Uh, and infection itself is not a contraindication, so it's just useful to remember. These are the kind of equipments we use. Uh, basically, we have the histoacryl glue. Uh, you can have the, the, in here on the right hand side, you have the list there, but on here, the cotton tip. We don't really use a cotton end, we actually use a wooden end. Uh, I prefer to use a, uh, a small tuberculin syringe for aspirating the glue to use later. It's just more precise. Uh, the glue is here. You have a skin punch, which is three millimeter wide, uh, and just a minor offset. And then finally in here, this is a sterile face drape. You can get it anywhere. So the idea is simple. You lay everything out like this. Uh, and also actually you need the condo lens as well. You lay everything out. You use the tuberculin syringe to aspirate the glue. It will stay liquid within the syringe. The reason you do that is that later on when you apply the glue, it's easier. Use the skin punch to punch the sterile drape that you had to make these round little discs. Okay, you can make millions of them so that you can keep using them. You put the glue on a disc and then you put the glist in the on the eye. Okay? And because the histoacryl basically is super glue, it dries out in seconds. You can actually watch it dry. And I'm gonna show you. Don't do it again. <laughs> so this is it in practice what we actually what I actually do. So I had a case of perforations, I lay everything out, put the wooden stick out, as you see, the glue is there. I aspirate the glue first, okay, so that you have plenty to apply. And uh, we make the, uh, make sure that you have a contour lens later on because you pretty much need to apply it straight away. You have the uh, sterile drape and you use the skin punch to make multiple of these discs, just in case you lose one or you, make an, you need to overlap uh, 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 the discs, okay? Once you have the disc, you can kind of shake it out, which I initially didn't do, I thought uh, I was all right. You can actually also stick it out as well. So put it all on one place. Then what you do is that, you can see the little round disc there. What you want to do is, first of all, put the wooden stick in some KY jelly or, or physical tears or whatever, so that it's slightly sticky where it will pick up the disc. Okay? So pick it up. And then using that needle there, I stopped it, the video there because I want to see that with the, the tuberculin needle sucking up the glue, you can have a very, very, very small drop just apply onto the disc. So that when you put it on a corner, it won't just go everywhere, okay? 
the next bit is something that you shouldn't really do. I have never done it again. Um, so this on a slit lamp, you can actually then put the glue on the eye, and you can see how quickly it will freeze. Okay, just count. It's on there now. One, two, three, and then you just slowly release, and it stays. Okay. The reason I say don't do this is because when I shoot the video, I didn't realize uh, I have to use stereo. And uh, to do to do the video again, you wouldn't be able to see what you're doing. <laughs> so you need two eyes to, to see together. So you can see that in five seconds, you seal the wound. And again, here in this example, you can see that we use multiple discs. And so therefore, if the perforation is slightly bigger than you know two millimeters and one disc is not enough, you can put one over the other to help. Now, it's important to remember that the glue itself is very hard, so it's very irritating, okay? And so is the disc. So at the end of the procedure, put a bandage contour lens on so that they're more comfortable, and also make sure that they have some topical as well as we use oral moxifloxacin, but whatever oral antibiotics you use to prevent or uh, uh, as a prophylaxis for possible infective endophthalmitis, okay? Now, it's important to talk about what we do but it's also important to know how we actually do practice some of the suturing skills and gluing skills and all those things. So I want to pass on to Dr. Ferris to talk about how we can use some of these models to help in practice. Sorry, uh, Richard, you want to ask a question first? Would you, um, I mean, if you made models, it's very easy in the sense that you don't even necessarily stitch them up yourself. Would you glue something if you weren't sure if there's a sclerotic extension? Is it just sort of glue or something? Is there if it's going to be possible sclerotic extension, there will be layered limbus your glue is not really going to stay because it's too wet. Yeah, so it won't actually stay. I think at that point, really, you're already heading to surgery. Uh, if you're talking about early evening, you're not going to operate overnight. One thing you could consider is actually, again, putting a bandage contour lens on the eye. It's not as easy as it seems. They tend to be a lot of pain. The eye's a bit small. You can't really fit the lens in, and then you try to open the eyelids and various things. So it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. Yeah. Okay. Which one is that? Oh, right, sure. Let me come up first. So many people have had a chance to repair a penetrating eye injury in person. That one, right? It's something we see less frequently. In the, in the days before seat belt uh, injuries, I'm sure uh, it was something that my more senior colleagues were doing on a nightly basis in, in the UK because people didn't wear seat belts and these horrendous injuries where they would go through the windscreen of the car that didn't cause the problem. They would bounce back, hit the seat, and then they would come back onto the old-fashioned windscreens, and they have you know, massive you know, trauma to the face, to the eyes. So penetrating eye injuries is fortunately relatively uh, rare. But we still see it, and I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist, so I see it quite a bit in children's uh, uh, injuries, especially in the summer with barbecues and various things that are going on. I had a little girl uh, the other day whose brother uh, was playing with his bow and arrow but he ran out of the little arrows with the rubber tips, so he thought he would just use a pencil, which he'd helpfully just sharpened. Uh, and went pew, pew, you know, straight through the cornea, big laceration, lens involved. And the principles that Simon so eloquently uh, outlined um, were wonderfully adhered to by the primary repair surgeon. So the lens was involved. There was a big high femur. Fortunately, no scleral extension. They did a beautiful job stitching the cornea together tying those knots tightly because of the corneal edema. Just let the lens you know, settle. The anterior capsule had gone, but they would just leave it, not as a primary repair. And then three or four days later, they went in and did the lensectomy, got an interocular lens, you know, half in the sulcus, half in the bag, cleared things up and the high femur. So it can be a stage thing. And one of the core messages that Simon was getting across, you don't have to do everything at the same time. Secure the eye, get the eye safe and then move on to the, the next stage. It's also worth reminding your anaesthetist, especially in the case of multiple trauma, that you are suspecting a penetrating injury, and they may well then in, uh, adjust their induction of anesthesia technique appropriately. It's quite obvious if they only have an ocular injury, you're going to tell them that, but if they've got limb injuries, chest injuries, and other things, uh, they may want to just bear that uh, in, in mind because it can have an effect on uh, intraocular pressure. Oops. So, to get on to sort of right. so the way to practice. Let's go on to the corneal bit. So, how to practice? 
the last thing you want to be doing is practicing your first penetrating injury on the patient in theatre. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes showing how to use the model eyes to simulate lots of different types of penetrating injuries. So let's go to corneoscleral lacerations. Uh, so here we're just using one of our basic strabismus eyes, which I have conveniently filled up with some egg white. Um, so we filled it up with egg white so as a vitreous substitute. You can use one of the advanced FACO eyes uh, as well, but these ones are better because they've got conjunctiva, tenons, and extraocular muscles. And so we're creating a nasty injury. So say you're a trainer. You don't show the trainee this bit. Okay? You create the wound of your choice. So you can make it as simple or as complex as you like. But you can see I've gone in beyond the limbus, haven't opened up the conjunctiva or tenons that much, so it's not that obvious that it's extended quite a bit posteriorly. Um, and then you'll say, right, come into theatre, could you assess and repair this wound? You could make it a bit more realistic, you get a bit of red food dye in that vitreous, so there's blood around and a hyphema. Um, and so the principles that Simon's showing the real video is what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to open up the conjunctiva and the tenons, I'm going to explore the limbus, and I'm going to try and find the most posterior extent of that wound. Um, this has been si uh, filled with uh, aqueous, we're making it slightly easier, but you can make it more complex by having vitreous. And again, you'd be using your wick to try and think, oh yeah, that is vitreous there, not aqueous. You see it goes right down to the medial rectus, and if I was really nasty, I would have extended it beyond the medial rectus. You could practice your strabismus surgical skills, hooking that muscle, securing the muscle, taking it off, because quite commonly that extension in real life will go back towards the equator. So you might have to take off an extraocular muscle if it involves that meridian of the globe. So getting good exposure and assessing the wound properly. Uh, and if you have some you know, blood substitute in the form of the food dye, you can make that blood and vitreous coming out to make it more realistic. And then the principles that Simon was talking about, uh, securing the limbus uh, and then going on to suture the cornea together. Uh, it's something you can practice and do properly. The posterior segment uh, disease, we have an, an easy way of uh, simulating you know, retinal detachments and, and, and other things you know, at the moment, but it's something that we're working on. But the principles of securing the wound, getting it together, uh, and doing it in a timely way, practicing your knots, as many of you were doing in, 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 the, in the dry labs. Because in the age of FACO surgery, there's so few opportunities to suture anything. You may have done a couple of hundred FACOs, but most of the people in the last couple of days and other courses I've run in the UK, even experienced uh, juniors and FACO surgeons, they've maybe put in three or four corneal sutures. Uh, so you've got to practice uh, your suturing skills. And it's a slightly different technique for scleral suturing, rectus muscle suturing, corneal suturing, uh, tensioning your knots and getting it right. Because uh, these cases can take a long time in theatre, and the quicker you have secured the globe and made the globe safe, the better the prognosis. Um, for, the, for the child. And the little girl that we've just spoken about, even though she was only four, and this happened uh, relatively recently, she's had a nicely teamed up, and now it's you know, three or four months uh, down the line. She's got vision of 612 with lots of patching because the wound didn't involve her center of her cornea. It's been nicely re repaired. So if you do things, it's a bit like having a PC rupture. PC rupture doesn't mean disaster. PC rupture, if you manage it properly, the visual prognosis should be excellent. Um, and the same with these injuries, step by step, take time to assess the wound, follow the first principles, and if there's posterior segment uh, problems, the retinal team can manage it. If there's a, a lens, well, if the lens is completely traumatized uh, and it's floating around in the anterior chamber, yeah, you've got to do your lensectomy and, and tidy it up at the same time. You can't really leave an AC full of lens material. But if it was just a breach in the anterior capsule, I would just leave it then and just sit tight and would plan within a couple of days to come back and do it, give the eye a bit of a chance to, to settle down. Um, and when it comes to corneal gluing, uh, I love the thing I've learned today. I love coming to these meetings because the tuberculin syringe, fantastic. Uh, you can practice that as well. So if I go to exit full screen. Yeah, it's a different video, isn't it? Um, so don't have to use the expensive theater glue, as Simon pointed out. It's just super glue. Um, so you can practice all those maneuvers. And in fact, in the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, one of our um, parts of the curriculum is you have to have done corneal gluing twice. 
because it's quite rare, they actually use one of those can be on, Three. on, uh, on s s simulation. <laughs> so just, yeah. Um, so no, just the corneal glue video there. Yeah. So you can practice again, creating micro perforations, slightly small perforations, and following the steps okay. Simon uh, just showed. So here we're just using the end of a pledget rather than the wooden stick. We tend to use a little bit of chloramphenicol ointment, you know, but KY it works just as well. And you can practice, you can spend an hour doing, you know, 10 uh, corneal gluings uh, and creating a little perforation with a diamond blade here. You can make it different shapes. You can make it star shape, simple shape. And just the, the steps, the things you learned you know, like today, not getting too much corneal glue there, setting the little uh, uh, bits of the face drape that you've cut you know, neatly on the eye, placing the contact lens on, on the eye. So when you come to do it in real life, you've done it three or four times. You're quite relaxed. You've learned from your mistakes uh, in the OR. Uh, and you can do all of this just with a little hand, with a little, one of the small microscopes. You don't have to be in theater to practice this. Um, and you can make the incisions slightly more complex as you get better. And it will leak uh, and if, you, if you don't do it properly. So it's an incredibly realistic way of practicing corneal gluing. That's why I like the tuberculin thing today. So you can get a small, one of the problems that I always had is trying to get a tiny little bit of glue on there. So uh, Leon Au, who was doing these videos, I'll pass it on to Leon in, in Manchester and say, I learned something from Simon today, a little bit of tuberculin syringe. So there are ways of, of, of practicing these things. I think penetrating trauma is particularly good. We're working on a, a model that's got an, an iris, a floppy iris, so you can then practice your secondary procedures. And some of ICAM has you know, great videos of iris reconstruction, things like that. You'll be able to practice your through and through sutures, uh, sutured uh, uh, PCIOLs, and things like that. You don't want to be practicing these things the first time um, in theater. Uh, so the principles, again, just to conclude, are that careful assessment of the patient. I love that slide, do not press on the, on the eye. Uh, exploring that limbus, making sure you're finding out the posterior extent of the wound. Uh, cleaning up the hyphema can be difficult. We didn't have a chance to touch on that today, but it is a problem, especially in children, because you'll aspirate with your bimanual the hyphema, and often looks beautiful, it stopped bleeding. Uh, and the next day, you come, sometimes this is just with blunt trauma. So you've got a child or adult who presents you with blunt trauma with a total eight ball hyphema. Uh, you can remove the hyphema going in with your paracentesis and all looks lovely on the table. And the next morning the child comes back and the hyphema's back again. Uh, and they can be very difficult to manage. And sometimes when you atropine, just to splint that uh, pupil, but it's often just worth waiting five, 10 minutes after you've cleared it all up and this isn't a blunt trauma case as well as a penetrating trauma case, just to see if there's any signs of, uh, of re-bleeding, because they can be very difficult to uh, treat, and then you're having the opposite problem, the pressures of 50, uh, with corneal edema and endothelial staining um, and, 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 and all the rest of it. So uh, high femurs can be difficult to, um, to manage. So hopefully we've given you, uh, thanks to Simon's uh, talk and Paul Sullivan's you know, slides, uh, and his Open Globe uh, book, if you've come across Paul Sullivan's amazing uh, VR books, which are free to download from iBooks. The Open Globe, many of the slides and animations there are in the iBook Open Globe uh, Injuries, which you can download from uh, iBook for free. He's got a fantastic Faker one he's done with Brian Little and, and Larry Benjamin. So all of the things that we've been showing are really just highlights of his work uh, in, in, in the iBook. And it's a wonderful way of you know, learning and a comp composition of animations real live videos and some simulated videos uh, as well. And it just means that you are competent to deal with these things, uh, having practiced them uh, beforehand. So thanks to Simon for doing all the work and, and inviting me to speak again. Uh, uh, any questions for Simon, principally, and myself? Uh, yeah. Any questions? Good. So shall we move on to the next? I don't have an HDMI adapter, uh, no problem. I, I think the patient has a... Let me get the other guy to help. Oh. Or... Um, well, first of all, you can plug the input. That's for the pointer. Okay, yep. And I will find the AV guy to help. Okay. Yeah. Is it, uh, where is the... Uh, okay, um... Right, they've gone to find me an adapter. So while we're doing that, I thought we'll just have a little uh, straw poll. Um, so how many of you ha perform or have performed a strabismus operation? Excellent, very good. So 
this is a problem, okay? I mean, what's happening is we have found, at least in the UK, over the last 10 years, the number of live births has reduced, and with it has reduced the number of squint operations we do, okay? We don't know why that is. Is it directly proportional, or is it that we're just getting better at now uh, diagnosing and treating squints early so so many people don't need a squint operation? In either case, um, you know, uh, it is something that is becoming more and more rare. Now, in the UK, all our trainees have a very strict curriculum, a surgical curriculum that they have to they have to follow. So they have to perform 20 strabismus procedures by, by the end of their training. And that is proving more challenging to, to achieve, I have to be honest, because uh, we don't have s that many to, get to go around. So I think simulation is key. And I was really happy to see Mr. Ferris's talk on, on how to use simulation. Now, we uh, allow our trainees to use five simulated procedures as part of the 20. But of course, nothing beats the real thing. So I'm just going to go through a little bit. Thank you very much for doing that. So let's hope this works. Um, okay. A excellent. Okay. So, so this was the first ever strabismologist, uh, John Taylor, 1703. Uh, he was very successful. He operated on Bach, among other people. He had a very simple strabismus technique. So he would come to you and he would say, okay, so your right eye is turning in, fine. So you make a little incision in the conjunctiva. Then he would patch the other eye, so your eye would turn out to take a fixation. So your eye is straight. And then he would leave town before the patch came off. <laughs> so he was very successful uh, and, and surprisingly had a long and very prosperous career. So things have sort of changed a little bit. Maybe, maybe not that much as far as surgery is concerned, but a little bit more as far as the principles go. So this is what I was talking about. You know, the top line just shows you the, um, the number of, oh, oh good. Uh, this just shows you the number of life births have reduced, and with them, the num amount of uh, strabismus surgery we perform. The question we asked ourselves is, well, do we need to train everybody? Maybe sh this should become a fellowship thing. I mean, what, what do you think? Do you think we should train everybody? James, what do you think? I think yeah, I think that's absolutely right. So here's a patient who came to us as a role free, and the problem was he had a retinal tear, and th that was cryoed, so you know, just retinal cryotherapy. That was fine. But you can see after the operation, he couldn't look up. And the reason was that he was given the uh, injection of anesthetic into the inferior rectus that had now basically inflamed and got fibrosed. And the, fir the first thing it teaches you is an appreciation of where the muscles are and what to look out for. I think the second thing it teaches you is where the muscles are, how far they are from the limbus, so you, to, you can avoid them or target them appropriately. For example, as in the, as in the penetrating in injury talk we just heard about when uh, you know, you would, you'd have to take a muscle off. If you don't know where it is, you don't know where to put it back, you don't know where it should be. It, shows, it teaches you when you look at a muscle whether it's complete or is it, um, is it bisected. And most importantly, it teaches you how to suture because we just don't do very much suturing nowadays. Okay, so we won't really go through this, but you know, there's a seven year run through program. And this is uh, what we do in our, our hospital. I usually have the fifth year trainee with me for, it used to be for a whole year, but now because people are not getting the competency, we split it into six months each so they can uh, get to do some strabismus surgery. Now, thing here to understand is that the, um, that the tenons capsule is a very complex structure. And, it, and all the muscles have connections. Uh, so you can see here that the levator, superior rectus, and the superior oblique. Now, why is this important? Well, if you move a muscle, you move all the tenons, which means you also move the other muscular attachments. For example, if you do a superior rectus recession, you move it back, it can also cause a lid retraction. So you have to be very careful when you move a muscle about these things. OK, so for those of you who have done strabismus, can you so just, just, just show me hands who's actually done strabismus surgery? Excellent. So can you tell me, how do you access the muscle? How, how do you actually get to it? What kind of conjunctival incision do you use? OK. OK. And you know, the, the limbal approach is uh, well, essentially this. You, uh, you make a limbal flap, and um, you reflect it. The advantage is, of course, you get a very good exposure. You can see the whole muscle. You can see the pockets on either side. The disadvantage is you end up causing a lot of scarring in the perilimbal area. Anybody else who's done strabismus surgery through a different approach? Anything? 
Okay, so what we do, and I'll show you what we do in a minute, is a fornix incision. We place it either in the inferior or in the, or in the superior fornix. So the advantage is it is hidden by the lid, so you can't see it afterward. The disadvantage is you have to have a conjunctiva that's stretchy enough for you to stretch it over the muscle, and it just you don't get that good exposure, so you have to be a little bit more uh, patient. Um, you can also make a, a radial incision. Okay, so what, what are the other things to consider? Well, the things to consider in strabismus surgery, the sclera has, doesn't have a uniform thickness throughout. So just at the front of the insertion, the thickest bit of the sclera, just behind the insertion is the thinnest bit. So you have to be really aware of that when you, when you do your, um, your suturing. So before you start, how do you identify a rectus muscle? Um, well, look at the eye. And I look at the eye un under, under magnification. So I use a microscope for strabismus surgery. Not everybody does, but you know, I put to you that it has a lot of advantages. And those of us who are doing intraocular surgery will find it very easy to progress from that to doing extraocular surgery under the microscope. And you can see here, these vessels that are, are sort of radial are muscular vessels, and these other ones are conjunctival vessels. If you're not sure what is what, just move the conjunctiva. And the vessels that do not move are the muscular vessels, and you know. Um, where you're going to go. So we're gonna talk a little bit about muscle weakening procedures. Muscle weakening procedures are just when you take the muscle, essentially put it back. So you do a recession, or you can, so this is just uh, showing your recession. So the muscle was here. We have put the muscle on a suture. We pass the sutures in a crossed uh, blade fashion to the insertion. We measure how much we want to uh, let the muscle back by, and we let it go. What's the advantage of this? This is really good for training because you're doing all your suturing here, where the sclera is, is the thickest. You have it under, under direct observation. And uh, if it's not where you want it, you can rectify that. Okay? The other option would be to take the muscle off and switch it to the sclera here. Again, the advantage of that is not leaving a lot of vicral behind, so you don't get a lot of inflammation. The disadvantage is, well, it's hard to suture back here, and it is relatively easier to perforate. Okay, they both have their advantages, disadvantages. If you're gonna do an adjustable suture, then you have to do this, and I'll show you a video in a minute. How do you strengthen a muscle? Well, essentially you have to make it shorter. So you can cut a chunk out of it and put the two ends together, or you can just fold it over. You call it a, you call it a plication or a tucking, depending on which muscle you're doing, okay? Right, so th this just shows you what I mean. So you hook the muscle, you measure how much you want to shorten it by, you cut the muscle and you put the two ends together. Okay, it'll become clear in the video. This is the adjustable stitches I was talking to you about. Okay, right. I think we talked, let's, let's look at some videos. That's really what we're here for. Okay, let's hope this plays. If it doesn't, I can come out and, uh, is it playing? No, okay, that's okay. Okay, so can you just uh, can you just put this on to the? Um, you can just put. I think you can display. Ah, thank you so much. That's uh, okay. How do? <laughs> so okay. Where's my? Uh, I think this is going to be. Do not just share the display so I can uh, we both have the same display? Yeah. Yes, yes. That's great, thank you. That's fantastic. Okay. Okay, so just to or orient you, this is the eye, you're sitting at the top end. You have um, you have pulled the eye up and in. So this here is the inferior rectus, this is the lateral rectus. So we're just going to uh, operate on the lateral rectus. Okay, so I hold the conju conjunctiva up and you make an incision in the conjunctiva, okay? And you go between the two muscles, which is why we're talking about identifying where the muscles are, and then you lift up the tenons and you go and, um, and do exactly the same. So you make an incision in the conjunctiva and in the tenons. You go through that and you hook the muscle, okay? So you see you hook the muscle here, and now we are going to reflect the conjunctiva over the top onto here, okay? Now, 
this is why I was talking about the, you need the conjunctive to be stretchy enough to be able to do that. So if the patient's above 40, you, you can't really do this technique unless you modify it. You can modify it by making the incision longer or you can do a minimally invasive technique, which I will show you in a minute, or you can do a limbal technique. They all have their pros and cons, okay? So once you've done this, you have the, your muscle here, okay? So now you can do either a weakening procedure or a strengthening procedure. For this, we're gonna do a strengthening procedure. So we make sure we, so what we've done here, just to orient you, so this was the first hook that we put in. This is the second hook the assistant puts and you stretch it. And you stretch to the um, amount you want and somebody has, somebody there is showing you how much, say six millimeter. And then what I do is with a little cautery, I just put a few dots so we all know how, how far back we need to go. Once those dots are put, it's really important that you do not uh, migrate anteriorly while suturing because it is hard to suture so posteriorly and we all go to our comfort zone so we tend to go anteriorly. So this is the measure, okay? Now, how do we do the suturing, okay? Okay, so this is just the video I was showing you. So, so I try and use the same technique for everything. So full thickness bite through the muscle and you come out. And you always try and grab the needle if you can as soon as you come out so it's ready for you to go for the next bite. Go half the thickness, half the length of the suture, and another full thickness bite. What's the advantage of this? You get every single muscle fiber. And even if your, even if, um, your suture slips or breaks, at least you have something that is holding onto the muscle nicely. Okay, again, I try and grab the, the needle, and then after the two full thickness bites, you do a partial thickness all the way to the, to the edge, taking in every single muscle fiber, okay? And we pull that in, and then you do a full thickness lock. Okay. Now, there are many ways of doing this, and you know, strabismo surgery is very diverse, and even if you've got two strabismologists in the room, they will do things differently, so there's many, many ways of doing it, but this is just a way I, I, I use, and I find it's quite easy to teach and for people to learn. Okay. So we do exactly the same thing on the other side. We do a partial thickness bite to the uh, edge, and then we do a full thickness. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Anything they want to ask so far? Yes? Yes, yes. Um, initially, I found it a little bit daunting to start doing surgery under the microscope but because I felt I needed a big field. But actually, if you think about it, all you need to see is the eye. You don't really need to see the nose or the other eye. or uh, You don't really. And... Um, and the best thing is very good for training because you know exactly what's going on and the trainee can observe you doing the maneuvers much better and you can record and, and play it back to, to uh, either to co comment on the technique or demonstrate various points to them. So all my registrars now get a video of the technique they're going to do the evening before so they can watch it and then they have no, no excuse that they can't do it the next day. Okay, so once you've done this, you do a bit of cautery in the middle, okay, and then you can divide the muscle. So now some people will divide the muscle very close to the insertion and not leave a stump. I again, because you know, I rarely do any primary screen procedures myself, most of the trainees do them, so I get them to leave a stump. Why? Well, you'll see in a minute. It makes it much easier to pass the sutures. I find it just gives them something to hold on to. Okay, so now you've divided the muscle, you've got now two cut ends, and what we're going to do is just uh, reattach it. Now just be very careful when reattaching. You don't want to suture that muscle to the stump, okay? Because then you just, you're not doing anything, you're just putting things back where they were. You really need to go through the sclera, okay? So I think here, the stump for so long, we do trim it a little bit, okay? And then you hold the stump and go through the base. Now remember we said we have the thickest and the thinnest bit of sclera, so you have a ledge there already, so you go through that ledge. Always, always, always keep the needle pointing up towards you. So even if somebody uh, you know, bumps your hand or the anesthetist bumps the table, even if it, it passes through, it'll always go up. Just never have it pointed towards the macula. Not, not a good move. Okay. You see? So we always have it pointing up. And it goes through the sclera. And if you're not sure, take it out and, and pass a, a much deeper white. Why? Because once you've finished, this muscle is going to become active. It's going to start pulling. And the whole integrity will depend on, on your suture. 
not for long. You'll be pleased to know. Within 24 to 48 hours, it starts to stretch, uh, to stick down. Uh, after a week, you can't move it at all. That's why we, when we adjust, we adjust it within the first 24, 48 hours. But um, but yes, the sutures need to be need to be done properly. Okay. So once we've done that, we are just going to tighten this. So you pull the muscle up so that the uh, both ends are are opposed, and then you just suture this. Okay. okay. That's just us tightening the suture. And just make sure you draw the muscle all the way up, because if it's hanging back, you won't get the, all the effect of your resection. In fact, you'll have done sort of like a Scott's procedure. OK. Uh, Andrew, just let me know when I'm out of time, OK? I'm just going to show you one more, uh, one more video. And if time permits, maybe one more. OK, so this is a slightly different operation. Now, an inferior oblique operation, I often say, is once you, can, once you do this, that means you've learned sprint surgery. You are, I'm happy for you to operate uh, with minimal supervision. This is an operation that looks very simple. And if you do it properly, it takes a very short amount of time. But it's very, very easy for things to go wrong. And um, so I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you what we do, OK? So again, exactly the same, inferotemporal suture, pull the eye up and in. Inferior rectus here, lateral rectus here. So we stick to the to the same script, really. Okay. So we again make an incision between the two recti. Okay. First the conjunctiva, then the tenons. Okay. Now once you've done this, you start pulling the the uh, tenons up, and you can you just see the muscle appearing here. Once you see that, either you yourself or one of your assistants just makes a little nick to open up the sheath. Okay. Now again, people have different ways of doing this. This I do a hand over hand technique. So you hold it and you pull it up, and now you cannot hold it for very long. It starts to bleed and swell and get keep um, um, friable very very quickly. So you only get one or two goes at holding the muscles. If you're not sure, you can just hold the tenon and pull it up as well. But because usually I can do it very quickly, I hold the muscle and you keep going until you find this white triangle. Okay. So I don't know if in this. You really need to see that, okay? Now, what's missing here? Blood, okay? You do not want any bleeding. Why? Because then it becomes a pink and pink triangle, and that's much harder to find. So you really, really want to minimize all bleeding. So here we are going through that white triangle, getting the whole muscle. And what you want to do is you want to come out. Remember that tiny nick you made? You want to come out through that tiny incision just here. And you do that, and you've got the whole muscle, okay? It's very, very easy to split the muscle to come out at a place you didn't want to come out. And if that happens, the problem is um, you, uh, you might as well not have done the operation because even you leave a few fibers of the inferior oblique behind to regenerate and you'll get, um, you get all the problems again. So once you've done this, then um, you stretch the muscle out and then you can essentially chop a bit out. The inferior oblique can be a very forgiving muscle or it can be, or it can be very cruel. It all depends on how you treat it. What you don't want to do here is open the orbital pad of fat. You do not want any fat here because fat causes a lot of inflammation. You get restriction. You get the um, you get an anti-elevation syndrome, and then the patient really will not like you. Okay, uh, another Andrew, is he here? Okay, I'll just show you one one more. <laughs> if he's not here, I'll quickly show you one more video, and then I will stop. Okay. We talk a bit about the adjustable suture. So here's us doing an adjustable suture. So again, you you um, doing a cross swords technique. So you have here we are weakening the muscle, so we're letting it go back. Okay. Okay. So we have. Okay. So what we would do is once this this is done, somebody shows you how how much you have on this thread. And you, you tie a thread at uh, at whatever level. So this is say six millimeters. You tie a flat knot, and then you tie a bow tie on top. Now, there are various ways now doing the adjustable. Some people will leave the bow tie really long and, and um, put a study strip on the cheek, and that means you adjust it. What we do is we just bury it under the conjunctiva, and if everything is fine, they can just go home. Okay. Advantage is you don't have to open up the wound again. Disadvantage is it just really lowers your incentive to carry out an adjustment. So you really have to <laughs> force yourself to. Uh, um, so I think people now who are high risk for adjustment, I do leave them quite long and on the cheek, so they're easy to access. You always better to do more, because you can always pull the muscle up more easily than it is to let it go. Okay, once it's done, you just put a conjunctival suture. 
And that's it, really. That's all I have to say. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to take them. Or you can oh, email me. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, right. So. Okay. We have more time. Okay. So let's just talk a little bit about um, the session so far. Do any of you have any questions for the uh, <laughs> presenter so far? Look, Mr. Ferris is here. Simon's somewhere. I have a question. Yes. That's right. Okay. So that's, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think there is no, um, I'm glad Mr. Ferris is there. He can, uh, can tell me what he, what he does. The reason I leave a bit of a stump is because I want for the trainees, I would like to have, to have something to hold on to when they pass the suture. Because otherwise, it can be very difficult if you've only got a tiny, tiny stump and you're trying to hold that and pass it. And this is a, a difficult suture because you know this is where the problems happen. That's why I leave it long. I have found actually it fibrosis away and there's nothing left. But uh, yeah, I mean, <coughs> when you're doing the fornix based approach, which is a very neat approach, you can certainly see why leaving a little stump there, even just a millimeter, is helpful because it, it, it enables you to hold the original insertion. If you cut it completely flush, it makes it mm -hmm. difficult to do that. But as you correctly pointed out, what you don't want to do, the easiest route for the trainee is to put that bite through the muscle. Yeah. It's got to be through uh, the, the, the sclera. Um, and everybody does things you know, slightly different. I do yeah. things pretty much exactly the same as, as that, but not through a fornix based approach for, for, for everything, the adjustables. Um, but the point I was g going to, to make is to get to this stage of amazing proficiency, it's back to, to practice uh, um, again. And with my trainees, an increasingly number, and perhaps yours as well, at, at the Royal Free, my trainees after six months with me have normally done 30 strabismus mm. procedures. But the only reason why they can get to do 30 is before they get to operate on any patient, they've already proven to me that they can do every step of that operation, resections, resections, inferior oblique, to a high level of proficiency in the model eyes. They take the eyes home with them, and they practice. Uh, and you can practice by yourself. Sometimes your partner has to hold the, the squint hook for you. Uh, but you can practice your scleral suturing, the needle handling. And it's amazing, even though they've done lots of FACO, you yeah. put them in front of a strabismus eye, yeah. and they find it very, very difficult. They think using the microscope is very nice. I tend to use loops. And even non-presbyopic uh, young ophthalmologists think wearing you know, loops, if you don't have access to much, it's really essential because it gives you that nice view. It stops you having your head like this, down on the muscle with the light from the operating microscope colliding your view. So microscope's nice because you've got a you don't need a big field of vision and you're in a nice position. It gives you wonderful uh, views of what you're doing. Loops work really well, but you've got to practice your muscle yeah. suturing. So when you come, we were talking yesterday about opportunities for training, making the most of the opportunities. Fewer squints to do, absolutely. Less time to do them in. If you already know about that technique and it's double throw, double throw, locking sutures, coupling, putting the bites yeah. in. Your operation, my trainees on average, it takes them 10 minutes longer to do a bimedial recession than it takes me to do it. Now, if they haven't done any form of simulation or practice, it will take them 40 minutes to do a muscle. Mm -hmm. It's painful. It's mm -hmm. bad for the children, bad for the adults, bad for anesthesia, and it's bad for your theater efficiency. Um, so on the, new, the simulation gallery, which is a new bit of the simulation of the surgery website, we've got lovely videos of my strabismus book, the DVDs of live surgery, splint spliced in together with the models to show you here's a step-by-step -step approach to modular training and I've had people from Russia and elsewhere email me to say look I've taught myself how to do squint surgery using the models and the live videos mm -hmm. of the two together okay and I'm acutely aware of the lack of opportunity many of you have to do any form of surgery uh, and strabismus surgery I'm sure is, is no different but if you can show people that you're competent you've already got all the skills of suturing identifying muscles hooking muscles and you move from basic eyes, and I can show some people after the basic eye without any conjuntine on to the advanced eye with conjuntine on. You can say, I can do all this. Mm. Let me do the operation. Mm. And back to the very first point you made, I couldn't agree more that we should be training everybody to do mm. some form of strabismus surgery because, as Simon's talk illustrated, the skills you've learned as a strabismus surgeon are essential if you're going to be managing uh, more complex uh, uh, injuries. 
So handling extra mm -hmm. muscles is different. They're just generic techniques. They're something every surgeon should have in their armamentarium. I mean, most of us are not going to spend our lives just doing being FACO jocks. At least I hope not. How boring would that mm. be? You know, or LASIK and things like that. You'd need to have those general skills as part of your overall mm. uh, education. And as trabismus surgeons, we like to think that we can teach you a little bit of neuro-ophthalmology, a bit of pediatrics, mm. a bit of adult stuff, but also surgical skills to complement your intraocular surgery mm. skills. It's interesting that point you made about lack of access to surgery. This is a, a pearl from my fellow who's from Australia. And, you know, I think that's really frustrating as a young ophthalmologist if you want to operate and you're not being given the opportunity because it's just, you know, it's very frustrating because this is not a spectator sport. You need to be in there. So what she said to me was she would say to her, her boss, oh, can I just do this step? Or can I just, can I just do the incision? I practice this. Can I, can I just do the suture? And you often you'll find if you go and do that step and you do it well, they'll probably let you stay in the seat and, and continue. So... Uh, nobody likes, you know, a trainee. I appreciate that a supervisor may not want a trainee hassling them for surgery. But if you say, could I just pass this suture in the conjunctiva, I'm sure be, they'd be very hard-hearted to say, no, yeah. you can't do that. And the way that I trained it was the same with FACO. So you, when you've been taught FACO, it's r little steps. You don't say, right, you've done all the icy stuff, let's do the whole operation. Mm. There's a bit of INA, and then yeah. there's a bit of sculpting. So the same thing. We start off with the basic eyes. We take them home, and the little jigs that we're using there, you give them a couple of these five-minute tutorials, and they go and practice scleral suturing muscles movements. Great, they're coming mm. on really well. Let's make it more difficult. Let's put it in the head that has a nose in the way and an eyebrow. Mm. Okay, you're getting good. Now, you're into theater the next week. Uh, let's put that suture in the muscle because I've seen you do it with, with this. Yeah, that's really good. Mm. See if you can reinforce mm. their learning. Well, let's go on to the advanced eye with conjuntinons. Let's just see if you can hook the muscle, clean the muscle. So next week, you show me you're competent with that. Let's do it on the real patient. And then you start stringing the bits together. Yeah. Uh, and you can do it safely. You can see their confidence grow. They're not stressed because they've done it 20 times already. They're feeling confident. There's been maybe a little bit of blood around, um, but they're used to using the loops, or you can do it with the, the microscope. Mm -hmm. And it means you can string all the steps together really quickly. Uh, it's just changing the culture of surgical training. It's mm -hmm. just no longer acceptable for your first scleral pass to be in a five-year-old child mm -hmm. with a potentially thin tear. You wouldn't want it for your children or your relatives. You know, so why are we still doing it? Why is it still acceptable that we just watch and have a go? It's not acceptable. Mm. There's a way of doing that. And it's better for patients, and it's better for you, and it's better for my coronary arteries, because I'm much older than you. <laughs> okay. uh, it's just less yeah. stressful. And you get to do more. Mm. And that's why our trainees will get to do more uh, than potentially they might have done a few years ago. Because right from the start, they're ready to operate or do bits of the operation. Uh, mm. And so the more they do, it's up to you, not up to your trainers, the more you do, the more opportunities you're going to get. And yeah. so it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. of your positive feedback spiral. Yeah. And it applies to all types of surgery, yeah. not just trabismus, but in particular trabismus surgery. Yeah, and I completely agree. And the last thing I would say is, you know, even if you don't have the eyes, a lot of these suturing techniques you can just do on, on you know, the, the, the little bit of cardboard that the, uh, or thermocol, the, the sutures come on. You can, you can do it on, on this, but you, you, it's very transferable skill. So, you know, yeah. do practice. The Tony Murray and Kate song was, again, with the simulation gallery, but Gabby, uh, a panel last night was showing lovely videos of a capsular rectus on a grape with a little quail's egg box. You know, just practice. It doesn't have to be high tech. Tony Murray and Kate song uses little strips of bacon. For practicing his rectus, he cuts them mm -hmm. into little strips like a rectus muscle and uses those. It doesn't have to be high tech. You can just come up with your own ways of practicing. There's lots of different ways to do it. But the message is you need to find some way of practicing before you operate on patients, whatever that happens to yeah. be. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. I think you probably have some time to have some coffee. Who'd like to move your uh, legs a little bit, get some coffee or refreshments? Yes, okay, we'll start in a few minutes while he's setting up. Is that all right? Yeah. So, um, so do, do you have the Mac connector? Which one? This the display board? Yeah. 